of you that may, may thank you, honey. For those of you that may think this to be true, and this is a good place to pick up a recording too. Let me tell you this. You no longer have the excuse, the devil made me do it. Can I tell you? The blood has taken away that excuse. The devil made me do it. Well, I'm sorry, but my Bible tells me that Jesus shed his blood in Gethsemane during his prayer, not my will, but your will be done, Lord. Come on, somebody. So he gave us the ability to trust God by faith. Amen. Let's go. Uh, place two. Can, some, can somebody tell me place two? The second place that Jesus shed his blood. Let's see how many of you were paying attention. Last night. Come on now. Say it again. Nice and loud. Being the image of God restored to us. Be the image of God, the image and his likeness being restored unto us by his shed blood. That means by his shed blood and his beatings, his disfiguration during the time of his beatings, according to Isaiah 52, 14, we have now come into the fellowship or be clothed by Jesus, by the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, so we can now take on the very image and likeness that was in the Garden of Eden with Adam. What was stolen from Adam in the Garden of Eden, which caused him to have to leave the garden, has now been established back to us, giving us the ability to enter into the kingdom of God, in enter into the courts of heaven, enter into the very presence of God. Because as you all know, sin cannot enter into the presence of God. Flesh cannot enter into the presence of God. This is why sin is so detrimental to a believer. This is why we must repent and ask for forgiveness that we may take on once again the nature and character of Jesus Christ. Sin separates us from the presence of God. Hallelujah. So here, here's, here's a little nugget for you. If even if you're sinning in ignorance, it will separate you from the grace of God. So just now, now this is where grace becomes powerful because even in your ignorance, God gives you an ability to come back into fellowship with him. Can somebody say amen? Grace gives you the ability to come back into fellowship with God. Listen to me, beloved. Ignorance is no excuse because God has given us the word. Let me tell you. Can I tell you? He has given us the word. Laziness is no excuse. Lethargy is no excuse. Relying on your pastor is no excuse. You have been given the Bible. Come on, somebody. Listen to me. You have been given testimony. Hallelujah. The word has become tangible in a Bible. So this is why I provoke you to study the word of God. This is why I tell you when we do teachings here every Sunday that you are tasked with getting into the word of God for yourself because laziness, spiritual lethargy is no excuse. But God in his sovereign love for you and his eternal mercy gives you the ability to come back into fellowship with him by grace through faith. Hallelujah. Let's just say amen. Let's say amen. Because it is by grace that you are saved. It is by grace that you are consistently being saved. Day by day, his mercy is new every morning. Come on, somebody. See, this is the joy of the gospel. This is the, the, the wondrous, ah, this is the thankfulness that we should have in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we can come to the throne boldly and unashamed and say, Lord, forgive me.
Hallelujah. And so by his disfiguration, by the beating that he took, the ripping of his beard and his hair, and the beatings that he took with, with, the, with the sticks and the staffs and the whipping of in the whipping post and the shedding of his blood and the ripping and the tearing of his flesh. If anybody has seen the passion, you would understand what we're talking about. The Passion of the Christ is an amazing movie with I'm so thankful Mel Gibson took the time to do it in its raw form because it really gave us an awareness of the suffering of Christ for our sake. I can't watch it without crying. In that in those scenes hallelujah and so now we can be clothed take on the nature take on the character of jesus christ because he that is saved let me tell you a person that is saved has a, a an, an inert an inherent drawing to the things of god he has an in i mean you see let me how many of you, come on, where's Jonathan Perez? Jonathan Perez, are you available? Jonathan and Danny, Danny and Christina, are you guys online? I'm here. Christy's not here. I'm here. Okay. Jonathan, do you remember, as a testimony to everybody here today on Sunday, do you remember that you would call me? With Danny, actually, I think it wasn't Chrissy. You guys would call me when you were walking in the mall. Do you remember that? I do. I absolutely what, what, do. What was it that you said to me? Do you remember? I said uh, something like, "This place is evil." Like I can't, like I can't even walk around without seeing something that's just like upsetting me or uh, disturbing me yeah. in some sense. How many of you are? Thank you, brother. I, I'm telling you now. Listen, this is stirring something in my spirit right now. I don't know what the Holy Ghost is about to say, but let me just say this: hmm. How many of you? have gotten so frustrated with evil when you start to see so much evil in the world like all of a sudden there comes a moment that all of a sudden you start to see evil everywhere how many of you can testify to that? and you get frustrated see th this is what happens with baby christians like when he was younger in christ he would call me up and be like, Mike, I can't understand that. I used to go to the mall and I'll be able to walk around this place. And it didn't, I, you know, it used to be a fun thing. Now I look over everywhere and it's like, I see evil everywhere. It's like, this isn't fun anymore. I gotta get out of here. This is a very, very common thing among saved believers in their born again experience. Because the Holy Spirit, when he begins to take resident in your life, compromise is no longer tolerated by the Holy Spirit. But, but he doesn't do it in a very aggressive way. He does it in a gentle way. He just starts to open your eyes to things that now your spirit man is going, ah, look at that. Did you see that? Man, that's no good. Look at this. Man, no, don't stay away from that. My God. My God. Because you're this is this is the second clip. This is how you know the blood is active and alive in your life. Because when you have beginning to put on the character and the nature of Christ, the Holy Spirit in you begins to activate and he begins to reveal. And now your heart begins to break for the lost. Your heart begins to break for the ones that are bound. You begin to now take on the nature and the character of Christ that you listen. And this is the danger of a baby Christian. Can I tell you the danger of a young Christian that is zealous for God? Because when the Holy Spirit begins to activate in you, what you want to do is you want to immediately get into missions. You want to immediately get into like, ministry you said no somebody's got to do something about this can any can anybody testify to that because i know i can can i tell you i wanted to do everything i wanted to do everything anytime the pastor at my church said there was a need i was raising my hand
can somebody tell me they understand what I'm saying? This is the danger. This is that because unfortunately, in our carnality, as we are starting to die, right, to the fleshly things and be awakened to the spiritual things, right? We're very much alive still. Antonio, you know what I'm saying? We're very much alive. So in other words, there's still some fleshy stuff that we need to get rid of. And one of it is self-control, right? <laughs> so we start, listen, oh man, I don't know why I'm going down this road, but I'm going. This is what happens to us intellectually in our minds. We start seeing something spiritually. Oh Lord, have a mercy. Give me the words to say this. But our carnal mind starts to begin to tell us, I got this. I could do this because I saw it. And because I saw it, I think I have the power. But the power that I'm using is my flesh. But nobody told us it's not by power or by might, but by his spirit. We don't know this yet. And so we begin to do all kinds of volunteering. I want to do this and I want to do that. And I could do this. And honey, we could do that. And let me tell you what ends up happening. All hell breaks loose in your house. All hell breaks loose in your life. It happened to me. I ain't I'm not playing. It happened to me. Can I tell you what God did? Now God did it. It wasn't the enemy. God did it. He said, slow down, son. Because not only are you going to get burnt out, but so is your wife. So I had to be, everything was snatched out of my life. Money, position, confidence. Can somebody hear me? I had to be undone to then be redone. I had to be, because I was full of pride. Can I tell you something? I was full of pride. Because the minute God showed me something, and I saw the supernatural and I started witnessing things that were spiritual in nature. Guess what I thought? Did somebody guess what I thought? Can somebody guess what I thought? Come on, somebody just tell me where I'm going with this. Because I know somebody knows. You thought you were doing it on your own. Number one, good. I like that. Yes, my thought. True. Anybody else? Come on. You thought you were Superman. Come on, man. Your faith started to decrease. Yeah. No, no, not my my faith. You said. Yeah. No, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> you, you, but you, you you caught something, didn't you? But but not yet. I thought I was Superman. That's definitely true. I thought I could do it in my own strength because I didn't understand what it was to walk in the spirit yet. I was still I was still baby. But go ahead, anybody else? I think the Superman nailed it, though. I want to tell you the third one. The third one is, I thought I was God's favorite. That I had some kind of supernatural wisdom that was beyond everybody else. Come on, I'm talking to somebody. That, that not everybody is where I'm at. Oh my God, let me tell you the ignorance the ignorance that I had. It was, listen, if it wasn't for the love of God, he would have zapped me with a lightning bolt. Because when I look back at that time, when I look back and I say, OMG, how arrogant was I? How arrogant? How full of myself? How wicked was that thinking? In my, in my, because you know what was really manifesting during that time? My flesh. God shows me a little bit of something. And here I am thinking, oh no, man, you know what? I, I, I the pa pastor? No, that's wrong, pastor. That's wrong. No, that's wrong, pastor. But you know, no, no, let me, you, 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 listen, you got to come over here because you know, you got to, let me show you what God is telling me. Oh, come on, somebody, stop. You don't understand. When I look back, I was like, Lord, have mercy. 
No wonder God had to break me. Thank somebody raise your hand and say, Thank God for the breaking. Thank God for the breaking. Wow. Thank you, Lord, that you did not leave me where you found me. Can you? I can just only God has the patience to walk it out with me. You don't understand. This guy right here that you're looking at, this guy was the guy, the know-it-all guy. Yeah. The guy that you would not like. If Oh my God, I don't know who I'm speaking to. Man, I did not have any friends, not even one friend. All right. Because I was the know-it-all. Okay. I was the guy that walked around with the chip on his shoulder that would tell you two or three things and would always debate everything you said. If you said something, I'd have to debate it. Just because I knew better. Can I tell you that old man creeps up sometimes? Can anybody be a witness to that? That thing creeps up sometimes. Even as a Christian, can I tell you self-righteousness is very real in Christianity? That's very real. Let, let me let, let me say this. Let, let me say this to you. Mm. Okay. It's, let me tell you what ah oh, thank you oh, i feel the presence of god i feel he just came on me like a blanket listen to this okay i want to say this to you i was told this when i was a baby christian thank you for reminding me of this lord when I was a when I was a young nephew, when I was when I was an infant in the things of Christ, I thought I knew stuff, but I and today I know that I knew nothing. But let me tell you what a what what a pastor said to me. A pa he was he was a pastor in training, and he said to me, Michael, the most dangerous time of a Christian's life is when he's about three to four years to five years into his walk with Christ. It was four to seven. But he told me three. He said three, but now I realize it was four to seven. Like it's three to seven years because it, it, it depends on who where you are and how dedicated you are in your walk, right? Because there's some people that that get saved and man, they dive in the word. Man, they just, they just, it's all in. But then there are some of us that kind of, we we love God, we know we want to be saved. We don't want to kind of do anything bad. And then we just kind of coast along. So it depends on how deep you go from the beginning of your Christianity. So we give it a range anywhere from three to seven. The most dangerous time in a Christian's walk is in that season because it's in that season because you know enough You know enough to believe you know something. But you forget where you came from. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I'm speaking to somebody. Listen, listen, listen. In that season, I'm speaking. Listen, this is prophetically for somebody on this call. It's touching your heart even right now. You're feeling it in your spirit right now. The, the four to seven year mark, some of you have been walking with the Lord longer than this, way longer than this, but you, but, but, but right there within that, within that time frame. Now I try to put it within the time frame, chronos. I try to give you a time frame, but I'm going to tell you something. There is no time in this because it all depends on how deep you went with the Lord. You could be walking 10, 20 years with the Lord and not really come into the true fellowship of the Holy Spirit. So I'm, I'm just trying to insert a time to give you an idea. But if this is, if there's a reaction in your spirit right now, this is for you. And I'm going to say this to you. Within the insertion of this time, 
you know enough to know something. But you're forgetting where you came from. You're forgetting what God took you out of. And that's a dangerous place. I feel the Holy Ghost. On. Why is it dangerous, Michael? I'm glad you asked. Because in forgetting where you came from, you become judgmental. You become pious. What is the word pious? Religious. You begin to look down on other people. You begin to be, you lack empathy. You lack compassion. You lose your patience quickly. Am I speaking to somebody? Hear me, beloved. Because the heart of Christ, the heart of Christ is long-suffering, is patient, is kind, is gentle. Come on, Raquel, you know what I'm talking about. Right, Raquel? Can I tell you, that old man rises up in me. I'm not exempt of this. I'm telling you this because it rises up in me too. And sometimes I have to rebuke myself. And then sometimes God sends me precious believers to speak a word into my life. Come on, Rocky. I call you out. And speak a word in season in my life. Because God knows my heart. And he knows that my desire is to bring people into the fellowship, into the redemption, into the, 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 the fellowship of Christ. But sometimes that old man that frustration kicks in. Come on, somebody. I want to see it now, Lord. How long are you going to take, Lord? And we lose trust. And like Danny said, we lose faith. Which is trust. Faith is trust. I'm going to tell you, that's, that's synonymous. Faith and trust are synonymous. Faith is trusting God when you can't see it. That's faith. That's saving faith. It's trusting God at his word. So you can replace faith with trust. So we put on the likeness and the image of Christ. That's what his image looks like. Does that not mean that sometimes we get frustrated? Absolutely, we do. And that's why we need grace, right? That's why we need grace. He says, in your he even speaks about anger. He says, He says, anger is an emotion I've given you. God has wrath too. But you know what God says? He says, don't sin in your anger. Come on, somebody. You know what I'm saying? See, these are the tough parts. These are the tough things. These are the things that we are consistently battling with as we mature in Christ. But I'm going to tell you something, beloved. There's a way out. Because as you mature, hello, as you mature in Christ, you get to a place of knowing. You can see and know that you don't have to you don't have to fight to get your way you don't have to debate with nobody they can they can have their tantrums all they want they can talk all the nonsense they want they can they can want to want to pursue attention all they want and at the end of the day you don't need to fight you don't need to struggle and you don't need to wrestle because there is a point, come on somebody, we're about to get into this teaching today. There is a point 
where the hands and the feet of Jesus will begin to activate in your life that he will begin to take you places and you begin to understand that it's under your feet you begin to hand, you begin to understand that the dominion of God is in you and upon you that everything that he gives you prospers that every place that your foot treads it's your territory why because he has given it to you he has gone before you there's a place of knowing there is a confidence in Christ I don't need to argue there's a place in Christ that you don't have to be right because you already know it there's no need for defense because God is your vindicator that I just have to look up in the heavens and say Lord take care of my daughter take care of your daughter take care of your kids father you got this this is beyond my ability and there is a place of peace ah, when you are in Christ there is a place of peace and it's not the peace that the world gives come on somebody there is a peace that only Christ can give ah. Ah, I don't know who this is for, but this is for somebody. You don't need to worry anymore. This is why Philippians 4, 6, and 7 states it clearly. It says, be anxious for nothing. For nothing. For your job, for your money, for your kids. Be anxious for nothing. But in all things through prayer and supplication connection communion conversation with god with thanksgiving in your heart being thankful because he didn't oh <laughs> ah make your request known to god make your request known. god take care of your daughter I get, I get it. Listen, I get into tips with my wife and all I say sometimes is God, take care of your daughter. And I walk away. She knows. And I give it to him because it's not something that I can handle. I can't manipulate her heart or her mind to do what I want her to do. I could do that, but I'll tell you right now. The Spirit of God is going to walk away from me. And my relationship with the Lord Jesus is way more important than winning an argument. Father, have your weight. Have your weight. Move on your people today. Move on your people today, Father. Break every, break every arrogant, prideful, self-righteous place in our soul. Let us never forget what you took us out of. Never forget. Let that testimony be true. Let that testimony be alive. Let that testimony cause boldness and courage in our soul that we can begin to testify to, the, to those around us and even testify to the Lord. Lord, look what you have done. Give them glory. Give them praise. Give them worship from that place. That's the true place of worship in spirit and in truth. That's right, Tommy. Egypt is not my address anymore. Come on, Thomas. Father, thank you for turning that mess into a message. 
Come on, Tommy, that's right. And when you look at your, if you look at the people around you, you look at them as clay in the potter's hand. You look at that mess and you say, thank you, Lord, that that mess is going to become a message. The very thing that is binding and, and causing those people to sin is the very thing that is going to be their testimony. We declare it and decree it in the name of Yeshua. Thank you, Father. Because it's time to win the lost. It's time to be a witness to those around us. To be the example of the Lord Yeshua. It's time. It's time. It's time to be the church. It's time. There's a call globally. There's been a shofar, a trumpet blast that has caused a shift on the earth. The manifestation of the sons of God are, is beginning. This isn't church as usual. Don't get caught up. Don't get caught up in the accolades of man. Don't do it. Don't do it. Not every place that you've been invited to either is a place that God wants you. You better make sure. You better ask the Holy Ghost. You better ask the, you better ask the Lord. Check your heart. Because wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there's power, there's dunamis, there's change, there's transformation. He backs up where he's at. He backs up his gospel. He backs it up. There's signs and wonders. It says, these things shall follow. These things shall follow. We don't want attaboys. We want to see the kingdom of God manifest. We want to see souls saved. We want to see people delivered. We want the sick healed. The third place. The third place. He won back our physical healing. By his stripes we are healed. That was Isaiah 53, 5. For those of you that want this teaching from last week, part one, of the seven places Jesus shed his blood. Please put it in the chat. Daisy will get your information. If you, this is your first time here, give us your info uh, privately to Daisy. She's, she's listed as Sister Daisy. You can send a private chat, put your cell phone and email address, or you can go to remnantrisingministries.org, remnantrisingministries.org, and register on the bottom of that page, and we'll get your information and put in there uh, that you would desire that information. But it's the best place to do it is here on the chat. Hallelujah. The fourth place, we already know we went to his, we went to the third place, baby. Bodily healing. Bodily healing. By his stripes we are healed. The fourth place, his head was pierced with thorns and he won back our prosperity. He won back dominion over the land over our work he won back the ability to establish provision father as provider matthew 29 i'm sorry 27 29 that's the fourth place he shed his blood the curse of the ground so now you can receive provision promotion favor of god now it's not a, now let me tell you something beloved this is not a gimme none of these things are a gimme they're not a gimme 
uh, write these down. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drill this as often as I can. Grace is for the ignorant. Mercy is for the ones who should know better. But favor, favor, favor is for the obedient. Ignorant ones, grace covers. The ones who know a truth but are still walking in disobedience receive mercy in their repentance. ones who should know better. And favor is for the obedient. Now favor, you, I don't know, favor is a place of blessing that all you have to do is think about something. A need that you want and it's provided. I can't even explain to you in words what favor looks like. You have to be in favor. You have to step into favor for you to even understand what that looks like. Favor is a place of, of, of nothing missing, nothing lacking, everything provided, peace beyond understanding. It is, a, it is an assurance. It is a place that is just absolute. It, it's amazing. It is it, the favor of God. The Bible says that Jesus grew in favor with God and man first God and then man favor is a place that you can walk into a room and people come up to you I want your phone number they'll sow into you they'll, they'll hey what do you do for a living and they'll want to give you business without you even asking that's favor it, it's just it's it, it is a place I cannot explain to you I cannot do it in the flesh you have to experience it. It is an experiential truth. The favor of God. And I desire it for every single one of you. I want you all to know what this is. Praise God. By his stripes, you see. Place four was, his head was pierced with thorns. And thus the curse of the ground was lifted. And favor, the favor of God has been granted to the sons of God. The favor of God. Has anybody here ever heard of the term open heaven? Open heaven. You've heard of that term? Okay. Let me tell you, open heaven. Can you just picture this in your mind? Yes, Miji understands this. When you walk in the blessing of the Lord, the blessing of Abraham, when you walk under an open heaven, whatever you ask for is granted because your heart is already in a line with the Lord. An open heaven is when you pray for something, it's done. Father, I want restoration for a person's child because you see, it has to line up with the heart of God, right? It's not about a Ferrari. It's not about $10,000 in your bank account, but I know more. most of you right now when I said that, you kind of lit up and said, man, I could use $10,000 in my bank account. I get it. God knows already. He knows your needs. He knows your needs. That's another teaching. But when you, listen, when you line yourself and bind yourself to the mind of Christ, when you bind your heart to the heart of Christ, your prayers change. They're no longer selfish, self-indulgent. They now become prayers for other things that are eternal in nature and not temporal. And then Proverbs 3 kicks in. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. And in all ways, acknowledge him and he directs your path. And then, and then, I'm getting ahead of myself. And then, as he directs your path, open heavens begin to emerge. Open heaven. Because when he has a plan, see, 
I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. It's his plans. We have plans, right? It says man makes plans, but who ordains our steps? We make the plan. <laughs> uh, but we allow God to move our steps. As we do what we think we need to do or we are called to do, he then starts, and sometimes it's an uncomfortable place. But I can tell you, I assure you that there are open heavens. Open heavens. When you walk in the will of Father, there are open heavens. Nothing missing, nothing lacking. Everything's provided. Hallelujah. Place four. His head was pierced with thorns. He shed blood on his brow for the curse in Genesis. 3, 17 through 19. For those of you who want this, that, that previous teaching, please just ask for the link. Daisy will get it. Now, let's go to place five. That was the intro. Let's go into now place five. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Woo! Thank you, Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. All right. So we're gonna, we left off on the fifth place that Jesus shed his blood, which was his hands. I, this is... This, this actually needs a teaching all by itself, to be honest with you. But I'm going to go through this with just enough so you can get an understanding of the, of, the, of the deep things of God. Just an understanding so you can go now and seek the deeper. Deep calls unto deep. And so I am praying, Father, in the name of Yeshua, Give your people wisdom and understanding and cause them to seek the deeper mysteries of your word, to dig deep, to uncover a thing. In Deuteronomy, you say, Father, that God conceals a matter, but it is a matter of kings to search it out. Give them the strength to search it out. In Jesus' name, amen. Now that I just prayed that prayer, um, I asked one of our brethren on this call to do a separate call during the week to teach you how to study the Bible. How many of you would be interested in that? How to study the Bible. Yeah? Okay. All right, amen. We've got, we've got a lot of folks all right good so then that would uh okay great so the man who i have asked for that you saw the responses i'm not gonna speak your name publicly yet um as we still have to get those details together and i don't want you bombarding him with messages <laughs> and so we're just gonna keep that quiet for now place five place five the hands the hands were pierced. The hands were pierced. The hands were pierced. I think it's John 19 that shares this scripture. Let's go to John 19. I think it's verse 33. Let me just make sure. The hands, the hands. Nope, it's a little bit before that. A little bit before that. So John 19, let's go to John 19. Let's read this account. I think, let's go to verse 1 and see. I'm going to just, I got to see this. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's okay. So then we can go to verse. Okay, great. Oh, man, that's another one. God, that's so good. All of this is so good. You would? Okay, let's do it. You got it. Go for it. You going to do the amplifier? Yeah, I can read it from the amplifier. All right, All right, so, so we're going to take 19, verse 1, and, and then we're going to get to where his hands were pierced, and we'll, and we'll take, take it from there. there. But we, we want to read you the scripture, because this is a powerful account of his crucifixion. Let's go. Okay, I'm reading from the Amplified. John 19, verse 1. 
So then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged, flogged, whipped, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and put a purple robe around him. And they kept coming up to him saying mockingly, Hail, King of the Jews, good health, peace, long life to you, King of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. Then Pilate came out again and said to them, Look, I'm bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him, no crime, no cause for accusation. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Look, the man. And when the chief priests and officers saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. For I find no guilt in him, no crime, no cause for accusation. And the Jews answered him, We have a law regarding blasphemy. And according to that law, he should die because he made himself out to be the son of God. So when Pilate heard this said, he was even more alarmed and afraid. He went into the praetorium again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus did not answer him. So Pilate said to him, you do not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered, You would have no authority over me at all if it had not been given to you from above. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. You did, you, did you just hear what Jesus said? The next time you look at your boss, you remember that. next time you look at a pastor you remember that the next time you look at your supervisor you remember that because even Pilate who was a Roman heathen Jesus spoke this truth to him. So authorities are established and taken down, promoted and demoted by the hand of God. Do you understand? So before we think we know the mind of God and what he's doing on the earth, think again. This is where humility begins. Because even the heathen, even the unrighteous authorities are put in place by our Father in heaven. And there is a purpose and there is a plan for them. Do you know some of you on this call by unction of the Holy Ghost are called to go before authorities and show them the power of the Lord Jesus Christ and the kingdom of heaven through your behavior, through your words, through your actions. Because that's about the only Jesus they're ever going to see. And Father has chosen you to go before unrighteous kings and authorities to be his hands and feet. So before you complain and murmur and curse them, you remember what Jesus just said.
continue. So Pilate said to him, you do not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered, you would have no authority over me at all if it had not been given to you from above. And for this reason, the sin and guilt of the one who handed me over to you is greater than your own. And as a result of this, Pilate kept making efforts to release him, but the Jews kept screaming, if you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. And anyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar and rebels against the emperor. And when Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement. But in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover week. And it was about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, look, your king. But they shouted, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. Wow. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription on a placard and put it on the cross. And it was, ris it was written, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. And many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews. But he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate replied, what I have written, I have written, and it remains written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer clothes and made four parts, a part for each soldier and also the tunic but the tunic was seamless. It was woven in one piece from the top throughout. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it will be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They divided my outer clothing among them and for my clothing, they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Salome, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. So Jesus, seeing his mother and the disciple whom he loved, esteemed, standing near, said to his mother, Dear woman, look, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple John, Look, here is your mother protect and provide for her. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. And after this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said in fulfillment of the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was placed there. So they put a sponge soaked in the sour wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and voluntarily gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation for the Sabbath, 
in order to prevent the bodies from hanging on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high, holy day. The Jews asked Pilate to have their legs broken, to hasten, quicken their death, and the bodies taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and of the others who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came flowing out. And he, John, the eyewitness who has seen it, has testified and his, and his testimony is true. And he knows that he's telling the truth so that you also who read this may believe. For these things took place to fulfill the scripture. Not a bone of his shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look at him whom they have pierced. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred Roman pounds. So they took Jesus's body and bound it in linen wrappings with the fragrant spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden at the place where he was crucified. And in the garden, a new tomb cut out of solid rock in which no one had yet been laid. And therefore, because of the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Lord, bless the reading of your word. You mute yourself. Excellent. So, I want to keep in mind verses 31 through 36, if you have your Bibles open, as we're going to go through that. And you're going to see, as I go down these, these last three elements here, or these last three areas, you're going to start to see some of that come alive for you. And I have a really powerful ending to this teaching today with verse 35. Verse 35 says something that many people do not know to this day because it, it, it hasn't, it hasn't um, really been shared. So Daisy, just bear with me, okay? So let's go back now to the hands of Jesus. So what do hands represent? What do hands represent? This is the fifth place that Jesus shed his blood. What do hands represent to us, right? Hands represent something that is used for work, something that is used to grasp, something that is used in, in light of our day-to-day -day abilities to do, our ability to do. Because without hands, it's very difficult to do anything. Hallelujah. So the shedding of blood by where Jesus was pierced in his hands, where we believe more it was around the wrist area, severing the tendon, making the hands useless. I'm going to say that again. Scientifically, they say that he was pierced in the wrist, making the severing the tendons and causing him to bleed out faster. But by severing the tendons, it makes the hands useless. So Jesus shed his blood by the hand. And what does that represent? So let's go now to Genesis 39.3. Genesis 39.3. I'm going to show you in Genesis 39 a promise of God. 
that will help us to understand a little bit more. Now the word hand, while we're getting there, while Daisy finishes typing, and we're getting to Genesis 39.3, the, the Hebrew word in the Old Testament for hand is yad, Y-A-D. And what does that mean? Yah, right? It defines as to take custody of, to lay hold of, to scrape. Man, I tell you, this is so good. To take custody of, to lay hold of, because only the hands can lay hold of something. Uh, to scrape. And also, it alludes to the strength of one's abilities. Strength of one's abilities is your hands. I hope you guys are already catching this in the spirit. 39.3, yeah, what do you have? Yeah. Genesis 39.3, I want to share some a promise of God, which you see in the story of Joseph. But this is the byproduct of what happened in Jesus' shed blood for us today. My God. Understand this. Genesis 39.3. Go ahead. Now his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to prosper, to succeed in his hands. In his what? In his hands. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry say, say that, that one more time. time. In his what? In his hands. In his hands. God called all that he did to prosper. In his hand. That means his work. Whatever he put his hand to, prosper. Do, do, do you understand what I'm saying? Antonio, come on, brother. That a man, that a man not only supernaturally gets a blessing, but that he causes you to be a skillful worker. He can cause you to have a special skill that whatever you, you do with your hands will be skillful will be good would produce a good product come on ah. hey now listen to this it also means that whatever you take custody of or God can give you abilities to take custody of certain things and be a good steward of it. And this, man, ay, ay, ay. The definition of what this means is God, when he shed his blood, Jesus, when he shed his blood upon the cross of Calvary, he won back our dominion, abilities, meaning authority, abilities both physically and spiritually and this is seen by the laying on of hands the laying on of hands why isn't it the laying on of elbow why isn't us putting our head to each other like this right why isn't it a kiss on the cheek? Why isn't it me stepping on your foot? But it's the ability of the hands. The hands. He won back authority. Come on, somebody. Say authority. Say dominion. Say abilities. There it is. By the shedding of the blood in his hands, he won back the ability for you to do good, a good job, to serve, to be used of God for the laying out of hands, for, for the ability 
for you to be a tangible help for those in need. To be a steward of God's people, places, and things. To be good at what you do. So if there's anybody on this call today that feels insecure that you don't have that you're not smart enough that you don't have a good abilities or that your work is subpar or mediocre or that you're constantly being rejected because you know you're you don't have the confidence of being able to do a good job or you're constantly being criticized because I know some some Listen to me. Some of us on this call suffer from some deep rejection from our parents, from authorities, from old relationships because we were told we're not good enough. Can I tell you right here today that the blood of Jesus has come to tell you today because the blood is alive. It tells you today that he died for that. He died to let you know that you can do a good job. He died to let you know that you can take hold of a thing and do it well. He came he, he's telling you today, I have given you abilities and skills to be a blessing to your family, to the people around you and to this world for the glory of his name. He shed his blood on his hands for you to take back the authority that was given to you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Let's go to the next one. Because I can stay there for a moment. win back dominion, your abilities. So I'm sorry, I'm talking to Daisy. So the shed blood was shed so you can win back your authority, your dominion, and ability, abilities. Some of us have multiple skill sets. You know, David said this really, David said a cool thing. A lot of us in the men's group, we love this kind of scripture because it's a man thing. You know, it's a oorah thing, you know. When David said, you teach my hands to war and my fingers to battle. Come on. See, it takes, you know, Scotty's on this call and, you know, he's military. And for those of you that are ex-military, understand that the government trains you to be a killer. They train you to have a certain skill set hand-to-hand -hand combat they train your hands to war and your fingers to battle you see there's certain and some of us can do certain things way better than others because we are god has given us abilities by the works of our hand that scripture that i just shared with you in genesis 39 3 speaks to this very thing this is a type and shadow of what the blood was going to give to the believer. It would see Joseph was, was just one man, but believers, we are many, and God has poured out his spirit upon all flesh. Can y'all say all flesh? That means you and me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Can it listen? We need to understand I need you and you need me. Come on. There are certain things I can do better and there are certain things you can do better. It doesn't make me better than you and it doesn't make you better than me because every one of us brings something special. Come on. Ah. We bring something special to this to this mix. Hallelujah. 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 Somebody say balance. That's right. Come on, Celeste, you balance me. 
Amanda, you balance me. You bring balance to my life. Hallelujah. Some of you cause me to have grace. <laughs> so, ah, ah, <laughs> look at Malta, Malta, you're hilarious. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, come on, right? How many people come into your life that cause you to have patience? You need them. You need them because they're cultivating a fruit in your life that you don't, you're not even aware is happening. Come on, Celeste, right? Ain't that the truth? We need each other. We need each other. Amen. So let's go to six. Let's go to six quickly. I call, Listen, I challenge you to go deeper. Go deeper in these things. You know, I'm here just to, to provoke you. But go deeper. Amen. Balance, Amanda. Come on. Hallelujah. Let's go to six. Now, this one was interesting to me. Let's go to Deuteronomy 11.24. Deuteronomy 11.24. This is his feet. Jesus shed his feet. Stay with me, Danny. Stay with me, Danny. Come on. Stay, <laughs> stay with me. <laughs> He's rubbing his eye like ready for a nap. Come on. Play six, six, his feet, his feet, his feet. He shed his blood when the nail pierced his feet. And the blood was shed at his feet. Where you can write this down for those of you that take note. His feet gave us the ability to follow. The ability to follow. To follow, to take possession. To follow and to take possession. Amen. This is the Hebrew word regel, R-E-G-E-L. I don't have, I don't think I have the, uh, the Strong's number for that. That means feet, regel? Regel, that's the Hebrew word. And it's in the Strong's Concordance. I don't have the number for that. Oh, 7272. R E G E L. Yeah. Daisy, you don't. Hold on a second. R E G E L, Raquel. That's uh, Strong's number 7272 for those of you that are the, the, you know, the theologians in the group that kind of dig on those particular words, uh, which means the ability to follow, to take possession to go swiftly, to be swift. Hallelujah, the feet. The blood washed our feet and enables us not to, not to only obey, but to follow. 11.24, Deuteronomy 11.24. The blood washed our feet and enables us to not only follow Christ, but to obey him when he calls us to stand, to go, and to come. <laughs> ah! Oh, man, I hope you guys are catching this stuff, man. This is good stuff. When you start reading scriptures like in Ephesians 6, when it says, when you have done all else, stand. When you have done all to stand, just stand. Listen, the blood of Jesus has enabled us to stand, to go, go and make disciples, and to come, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. You guys got to get this. Listen, the blood enables us by not only the function of our will, but the physical the physical ability to go where he's calling us to go. To stand when he calls us to stand. To be swift to come to righteousness and swift to run from evil. Woo, this is both physical and spiritual. The connotations here are deep. So when he shed blood on the cross, on his feet, he gave us abilities to stand, to go, and to come. 
Hallelujah. Now I'm going to give you some scriptures that are going to encourage you. Deuteronomy 11.24. Go, Daisy, if you have it on the Amplified. Deuteronomy 11.24. Go, Daisy, if you have it on the Amplified. Deuteronomy 11.24. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall become yours. Your territory shall be from the wilderness to Lebanon and from the river, the river Euphrates, as far as the Western Sea, the Mediterranean. <laughs> blessed is blessed is the one who brings good tidings of the gospel. Blessed are the feet of those who bring the gospel. The shards of peace are part of the armor and they go on your feet. The shed blood of Jesus enables you to stand, to be strong and courageous, to not be afraid, to go where he calls you to go, to come when he calls you to come. You gotta, you gotta meditate on this one. This is not. This one has to be captured. This one can't be caught. This one has to be captured. It has to be caught. Let's get, let me give you a couple of scriptures so that way I, it can help you along. So here's Deuteronomy eleven twenty four that talks about the territory is under your feet. Whatever wherever your feet tread, it is yours. You don't have to be afraid of it. Malta, when Malta, you set foot on that land, when you bought that house, God says, I have given it to you. So if there's any squatters, any trespassers, and anything that doesn't belong there spiritually, guess who they have to bow to? They got to bow to the Jesus in you. Because it is yours. Do you understand me? Listen, when a, I, I understand when when we are young Christians and we are nepios and pation and technon and we're in the immature or the or the premature stages of our growth in Christ as a born again believer, I understand when you call a pastor to your house to anoint your house because you want it to be blessed. I get it. I understand that because you understand your authority in Christ is not there yet. You don't have it there yet. You don't understand the concepts and the confidence of the authority you have in you. So because of that ignorance, you, you call those that are walking stronger and more steadfast and more courageous to come in and say, I need your faith to join with my faith. I understand that. But can I tell you something, believer, that you already have the authority in heaven. Because Jesus shed his blood that wherever your foot treads, he has given it to you. Because you are a believer in Christ. This is why we don't have to walk around with shame, guilt, and condemnation. Because we receive the forgiveness of our sins in Christ Jesus through the blood. Because there's power in the blood. There's power in the blood. It is not by your power not by your might, but by his spirit, says the Lord. Because it is by the blood. When we invoke the blood through forgiveness, through repentance and of, of forgiveness of our sins, when it is true repentance, when it's repentance that says, Lord, forgive me because I have grieved you, Lord. But I now choose to turn away from this thing because I know that it grieves you, Father. It is not the fact that you've turned away from it, but the fact that you have repented, you have received grace. The turning away is by the volition of your will, which he has also shed his blood to forgive you for making a mistake and even a bad decision. Y'all not ready for Y'all not ready for this. Cecilia, you ready for this? 
So our bad decisions are under the blood. Come on. Ah, uh -huh. Our bad decisions are under the blood. We don't have to carry them around like a badge of shame. Like in the like like in the old days, they had the they, there was the mark. What was the name of the mark that they would put on women when they were shamed? The scarlet letter. Thank you, Holy. How many of you know what a scarlet letter is? Let me tell you, back in the Middle Ages, women who were marked with a scarlet letter for whatever the reason, it could have been because they were they were deemed as witches. They deemed as though they were unclean. They were they were not virgins, or they you know they were raped, or whatever the case may be. It was a very it was a very sad time. Let me tell you. But I'm going to say this to you: they would mark them with a red letter. I don't know what the letter was, but it was a red letter, any a, a letter of the alphabet. They would mark the, and they would have to wear a dress with that letter. It's called a scarlet letter. It's it's a letter. I think it's a letter R. Or something. I think whatever the sin was. What was it? What was it, Aileen? Mark the mark is whatever you did. So if it was adultery, you had That's a mark I mean. of A in red. And it would be sewn on all your clothing. Right. And anytime you walked out, people would scoff at you. You right. couldn't go anywhere without being you were scoffed. Marked. Right. You were marked. You were shamed. Right. You were shamed in public. Well, can I tell you today? Thank you, Aileen. I appreciate that, my sister. Can I tell you, I man, see, but this gets me excited because today we got the blood, you see? So whatever, whatever, it, whatever it was, whatever it is, the blood has the power to redeem you. So what the devil would like to put on your clothing, what the devil would like to tattoo on your arm, he says, Jesus says the blood washes it off, takes it off. He says, you don't have to carry this around no more. Shabrahida. Listen to me, beloved. I'm telling you, your, your worst mistakes no longer have power. Not even death has power. In the name of Yeshua, we have victory by the blood of Jesus. Your worst mistakes are under the blood. So walk with your head up and your shoulders back. Because the forgiveness of your sin has come. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. I don't care what you did. And I don't care what you're doing. The blood. The blood speaks. Repent. Change your mind. Change your ways. We don't have to be dependent. We don't have to be dependent on anybody. Any person, place, or thing. We don't have to be dependent on drugs or liquor. We don't have to be dependent on other people's accolades. We don't have to be dependent on what somebody else thinks. Because your opinion is not our reality. What matters is Jesus. What matters is the blood. What matters is what he says. Walk in the obedience of Christ and hearken to the word of the Lord for his blood has made a way. All these things shall be added unto you. All these things, everything you will ever need. Do you not know that his name is the I am? Do you not know this? I am. You fill in the blank. What is your need? What is your need? Because God today says, I am repentance. I am deliverance. I am your provision. I am your healing. I am your familial restoration. I am salvation. I am your strength. I am your light. I am. I am love. 
the love that you that you so desperately are seeking. I am your validation. I am your acceptance. I am your adoption. I am. I am. You fill in the need. I am your forgiveness. I am everything you need. I am your shalom. I am your peace. This is foolishness to the world. Those that don't have the Holy Spirit cannot understand these things. Why would we hold them to it? Why would you judge those that are unsaved if what we have, they cannot comprehend? Beloved, can I tell you, just because somebody calls themselves a Christian doesn't mean that they have the Holy Ghost. Please, please understand this. Discern a thing. Open your eyes. Open your heart. See truth for what it really is. Because the way a person carries themselves, the way a person speaks, tells you who their master is. And many, many Christians are under a spirit of deception. They are deceived. They are ruled by their flesh. So can we be the light that illuminates the darkness? Can we be the love that accepts the rejected? Can we be the hands and feet of Yeshua, cultivating patience, gentleness, kindness, love, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost? Can we be the ones with self-control so we can show others that the God in us, the Jesus in us, the Holy Spirit in us has control? That He is truly Lord? and not just the savior because the last time I checked he doesn't just want to be your savior he wants to be your lord and when we call somebody lord that means we submit to the lordship amen hallelujah I've got a few more scriptures I want to share here when I, when I get through this. Oof. Hmm? Romans. Let's go to Romans 10, 15. Romans 10, 15. Thank you all for staying with me. Thank you all. I understand that Aileen and, and her husband, they have a, a, a missions trip that they're preparing for and they had to leave earlier. Thank you guys. For staying with me and hanging in there this is very important this is very important that you understand these things because for the future when all darkness breaks forth on this land and in the people and we're forced to do certain things and take a mark and you will be able to stand you'll be able to stand on the blood of Jesus, the rock of our salvation. Hallelujah. Romans 10, 15, Daisy. And how will they preach unless they are commissioned and sent for that purpose? Just as it is written and forever remains written, how beautiful are the feet of the those, the how one. beautiful are the feet, the, what? the feet, the feet, the feet of those who bring good news of good things. There it is. The 
sent ones, the apostolic. Beautiful are the ones that come to you that were led of the Holy Spirit that come to you with the good news. Beautiful, God says, are their feet. Beautiful are their feet. And we're not talking about pedicures and, you know, I know that was running through some of your minds. I know you, I, I heard it. I heard it in the spirit. I heard it in the spirit. You know, you don't think the Holy Spirit don't have jokes. He got jokes. But I know, I know what y'all, some of y'all were thinking. Some of y'all need a pedicure, I know. But they're still beautiful because they're anointed. They're anointed. <laughs> Praise God. They are anointed, beautiful, fragrant, sweet are the feet of those that bring the good news. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, Daisy wants to read it. Daisy's chomping at the bit over here, and I'm holding her back a little bit because I want to get through some of this material. But I'm telling you, she is chomping at the bit. She's like in her chair. You don't see her? She's like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. I love it. I love it when she gets like that. Hold on. Now she's going she's gonna to share. All right. I didn't have to. I just Romans, Romans, <laughs> uh, Romans 10, 15. It says, and before someone can go and tell them that person must be sent. You and I have to be sent by God, by God, by the spirit of God, by the Holy Spirit. That means the, the, the Holy Spirit leads us to those assignments. And sometimes we ask ourselves God, what are you doing? Why do I feel like I have to call this person? Why do I feel like I have to go knock on this door? Why do I feel like I got to tap this person on the shoulder? And it says that God himself says, we have to be sent. So how can we preach unless we are sent, Hardy and Janet? This is a season in which we are all being sent right? There's a prompting in the spirit, right? Of, of this remnant that we are called, not just remnant rising. I'm talking about all over the world. There's a remnant that's being prompted in this season and in this hour to preach something, to be sent, to be called, to visit someone. And you don't know, you're just getting in your car and you're driving and you're being obedient because it's in our obedience that God is calling us in this hour to be sent and called of him so that here in this translation is how beautiful how welcome it's translated how welcome how timely is the persons who whose feet who come to bring right to proclaim to preach to deliver a news we are called in this season, in this hour, to deliver a news. It's like, you know, when the when the paper boy in the 1960s would ride his bike and he'd be like, eh, delivering the Yo, news. No, dude, dude, the dude. But wait, but how many of you on this call ex know exactly what she's saying that when Daisy calls you, you were like, man, or somebody calls you at a certain particular time, that it was right on time. It was like, yo, if it weren't for that phone Testify. call, if it weren't for, oh, Shabrahita, man, that's some good stuff. Yo, testify to that. How many of us been on that other side of when that call comes or that, door, or that knock on the door? Oh my goodness, can I tell you? Oh, why, why you let me open the mic? Listen, listen, yesterday we went to a, a, a memorial for Michael's second, second mm -hmm. cousin's uh, husband. And, and and we were on the on the program. We didn't realize we were going to be on the program. And they put us last. <laughs> they put us last to speak. And we had no right idea that we would be the one speaking right before the pastor. God's timing is so perfect. And, and and one of the things that was said throughout this memorial um, about his cousin's husband, David, which we were recipients of, that he would always show up and talk about the gospel, his mission trips, 
um, his time in Bible college, his time opening up a Christian school. And so uh, one of the things I walked away with before I got on that on that platform to speak was, wow, legacy, right? We talked about legacy. And everyone spoke of how he would sh just show up. And, and one of the one of the things that we were recipients of is that he would he would show up at our house in a, at Random. randomly random times of the day just show, up. just show up wouldn't even call just ring the doorbell hey mija he would say hi mija cuz mujer de dios cuz he would say it in spanish to me and then he would say hey michael man of god and he would sit with michael sometimes michael would still be in pajamas <laughs> and he'd have michael sitting in the living room for like two and a half hours just talking about things of god and i thought wow what a legacy what are we leaving? Are we are we welcome? Are we bringing the good news timely and in a welcome way? Are we being welcomed? Are you prompted by the spirit to knock on somebody's door and be random? Are you are you prompted to just show up? Are you prompted to travel a couple of hours because God has called you to to be with that person? Random. I'm talking about are you obedient? To the call of God, that God is because we have to be sent of God. There's a drawing, Amen. and there's a call on our life. But when it is of God, man, it's a beautiful. Your feet are called beautiful. Why? Because they are welcome. They're a timely. They're coming at a timely moment in a person's time of need. They could be a time of drought where they are thirsty for the word of God and they just need another brother and sister to come into agreement. And it's a refreshing because all they've heard was negative things. Or maybe they've dealt with their job and they're in a secular environment. And here comes this person. Oh, Jesus. And it's timely because now what their delivery is all about God. The good news the proclamation of the kingdom of God. Mm. Amen. What legacy Man, are you, you know, and I leaving behind? Man, you're me. What are we speaking of? Kill what do me. people say about us when they when you get off the call? What do you say about ah. Mike and Daisy? What are people saying <laughs> about you, Malta? What are they saying about you, Hardy and Janet, when you leave the church? When you when they leave your house? What what are they saying about you, Celeste and Vilma? What are they saying, Danny? Are you bringing the gospel? Are your feet beautiful when you are you tread are you demonstrating threshold are you ministering the word of god is it a positive thing that is being said what's your legacy what's your legacy are you are your feet named beautiful in Ooh. the name of god Jesus. Are your feet beautiful? Oh, there's something more I want to say, but I'm going to hold off. Because that has nothing <laughs> know, to do with this I message. know it's been happening to me all day. It's happening to me all day. We're man. in a time, listen, I was talking to Raquel earlier and I was like, I was like, Lord, ah. we're in that season of, the, of Noah's Ark. We're in that season. It's a modern day Noah's Ark. If you can spiritually see that the doors are starting to close. I'm getting emotional because the time is near. Are you sharing the gospel? It says you are to be ready in season and out of season. That means that sometimes the seasons will be inconvenient to you to share the gospel. It will be uncomfortable. It will be to the very people that spit in your face. It'll be the very people that are curse you. But time is short and the ark the doors are closing and let me tell you something Noah didn't close the doors it wasn't Noah that closed the doors it was God that closed the doors Jesus when God closes the door there's no man that can open that door my God 
And Raquel said something to me as I was saying it. She said, God didn't allow Noah to close the door because if Noah could close the door, he could also open it when he heard the knocks of the people waiting to the last minute to board. But when God says, no more, I've given you all opportunity to share for your feet to be called beautiful. And when I shut that door, there's no one that can open it. So what legacy are you leaving? Amen. Amen. Are your feet beautiful? Because he died for them. Because his feet were pierced for yours and mine to walk on this earth freely, to share with dominion to take dominion over the earth territory take back the ground that the enemy stole it starts in our home amen you know as daisy man as daisy brought that powerful powerful word i heard something about a job How many of us on this call are employed in places that we are, we want to leave, we want to run from, but yet we don't understand why we can't go or why no other door has been opened. Can I suggest something to you today? Perhaps God is looking for you to be the one to bring the good news. Perhaps there is somebody in that place that God is after. Perhaps the Lord has an eye on somebody there and you are the one that was sent. And but but in our flesh, we're complaining, we're murmuring, and so distracted with our own desires for more or for better that we can't. We snuffed out the voice of the Lord. We done snuffed out His voice, and because we're so caught up with our own emotions we can't see the assignment that we were sent to accomplish and the reason why no other door opens because until the assignment is complete (laughs) Alleluia Lord, speak to your people today. Speak to your people today. Oh, sure they come. So, Daisy, <laughs> I know, I've been, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it. The fire of God is on this word today. Awaken what needs to be awakened in them. Let it be done according to your will and purpose for their lives, Psalm 3723. Psalm 37, verse 23. Psalm 37, verse 23. When people's steps follow the Lord, God is pleased with their ways. When people's steps, when your steps, when my steps are made firm 
and established by the Lord. We follow him. God is pleased with, he delights himself in our ways. I'm going to read that in the Amplified. The steps of a good and righteous man are directed and established by the Lord. And he delights in his way and blesses his path. Okay, I'm going to read that one more time for those of you in the back. Hey, Jody. Glad you're here, man. Good to see you, Jody. God bless you. Hallelujah. The steps of a good and righteous man. It didn't say an unbeliever. It said the steps of a good and righteous man are directed and established by the Lord. And then it says, and he delights in his way and blesses his path. Come on. Tell me that the feet, your feet don't matter. Where you tread matters. How you walk matters. And this all begins in the heart. The good and a righteous man are directed. See, goodness and righteousness is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, when a man is aligned with the mind and the heart of God and is in the will of God, you can hear his voice. And when you can hear his voice, you can be directed. When you can be directed, you can be established. When you can be established and you are in the favor of God, you are blessed and so is your path. Ah. Uh. <laughs> This is good. So can I tell you today, beloved, that the blood of Jesus has made a way for you in every area of your life. Every area of your life, even to the point of where your feet tread. Even the very path that you take in this life has been ordered by God. Go to Joshua 1.9. Daisy. Go to Joshua 1 9, Daisy. We're going to finish this up quick. Joshua 1 9, and then we're going to end with the piercing of his heart. What time? All right, good. Well, we'll you should be done by 5 30, God willing. All right, let's do this. Joshua 1 9. We're going to finish the feet with Joshua 1 9. Oh, man, this is good stuff. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified or dismayed. Intimidated for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Wherever you what? Wherever you go. Wherever you what? Wherever you go. Wherever you go. Wherever you go. Go oh, where your feet take you. Wherever your feet take you. God is with you. He's with you. And then he will lead, guide your steps, and then he will establish. See, I'm going to leave it right there. You guys get the picture. Is there a question? Is there anybody who has a question in this? I'm going to say this to you, beloved, and I think, thank you, Holy Spirit. Listen, listen to me carefully. When you are born again, I, I'm going to reiterate this over and over and over again because we need to capture this because some of these things might be going over our head as I just saw something in the Spirit. So I want to say this and reiterate this. When we are born again, we are infants. And as infants are born, you know when infants are born, every, they see light, but they see it dimly. 
things are, are, are blurry. They don't have focus in their pupils yet to see things clearly. So they become very dependent upon the parent for everything. So it is with a Christian, a born-again believer. So if you're not understanding, grasping, or really truly getting this concept, it's okay. It's okay. Study. Look it up. Research it. Pray. Ask God to show you. If there's a contradiction in your heart and you're saying, but wait, but wait, but wait. Hallelujah. The contradiction does not lie in us, right? I mean, I'm sorry. The contradiction doesn't lie in the truth. It lies in us. In other words, our lack of understanding. The word of God is true and it's harmonious throughout all of the scripture, Old Testament and New Testament alike. It doesn't contradict itself. Where the, the doubt and the uncertainty and the, and the lack of understanding lies, it's in us. So don't hold yourself too harshly, religiously, because as an infant requires nourishment to grow up and see deeper things, so does a born-again believer. And that's why we're here. That's why you have elders, brothers and sisters that have gone before you that can help you grow. So do not hold yourself to such a high account that, oh my God, why can't I get this? Because as a newborn baby or a toddler or a young preteen, there are certain concepts that may not necessarily be able to be grasped right now because you need situational or circumstantial intelligence. You need to go through some things before you can look back and say, oh, that's what it means. Does that make sense? Come on, Danny, you know what I'm talking about, brother. So I'm not here to try to rush you into understanding certain spiritual truths. I'm here to provoke you to desire to learn more. So don't let shame, guilt, and condemnation come in as we teach these higher things because God will show you in due season. But you are responsible to walk out what you already know to be true. Can I get an amen? Hallelujah. Praise God. That's good. That's good. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Man, God is good. Isn't he good to us? He's good to us, man. Because let me tell you something. You are not supposed to be losing your joy. Because with last I checked, the kingdom of God is not talk, meat, or drink. The kingdom of God is joy, peace, and righteousness in the Holy Ghost. Did you hear me? If somebody was ever to ask you what the kingdom is, that's the kingdom. Joy, peace, and righteousness in the Holy Ghost. It's not a full refrigerator. It's not being debt-free. It's not having a nice house or a nice car. That's not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is joy, peace, and righteousness in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. Where those things are present, the kingdom of God is present. And that's a good time to say amen. The seventh place that Jesus shed his blood was when the Roman centurion pierced his heart. We're almost done. Pierced his heart. When he was pierced by some people in the Catholic religion say it, it was the spear of destiny. That's what they refer to it as. 
but when his heart was pierced, it pierced, it went through a rib, broke a rib, and it pierced his heart where his heart exploded. And out of his heart came water and blood. Now I want to end this with a, with a really cool story. And so what did the blood and the water that came out of his wound do? Hallelujah. It won back our joy. It won back our peace. It won back our emotional stability. It won back adoption rather than rejection. It won back love. the understanding of true love. It won back the wounded heart, the broken heart, the inner hurts, the bitterness of soul. It won back joy from anger. Hallelujah. The church was born by the piercing of his heart. The piercing of his heart sealed the deal. The piercing of his heart is what signed the covenant. Hallelujah. Let me share with you a quick story. But before I do that, let's go to John 19, 34. John 19, 34. So the, the, the piercing of his heart won back inner and emotional healing. The healing from rejection and anger, bitterness. The wounded heart, the broken heart. John 19.34 and then I'm going to end with a quick story I think you guys are really going to enjoy this John 19.34 but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came flowing out now if we go back to John, I think, 19, remember I told you we're going to remember this particular paragraph with emphasis on verse 35. I think it was 35. So let's go. Now I'm going to go. I'm going to double back to, to John 19, verse 35. There is something in there that was a mystery or secret that needed to be dug out. It wasn't so very deep under the surface but it required extra study. And I want to share something with you that is really cool. Hallelujah. If we can go to John 19, honey, I think it's 35, right? Yeah, John 19, verse 35. Yes. Let me get there, hold on. So you're doing uh, Amplify? Yes, sir. Okay, we're going to end with this. Verse 35. And he, John, the eyewitness, the eyewitness who has seen it has testified and his testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth so that you also who read this may believe. Okay. Now, this is our, so there is a story, right? About a Roman soldier. Now, I don't have the text, the sourced text from, the, from 44 AD, but there is documents that state that the Roman soldier's name, now a lot of people call this a myth or a 
just a story. Right. But I want to share this with you because I, I, I researched this a little bit and I found this and I wanted you to check this out. So the Roman soldier's name was Longinus or Longinus. Longinus, right? And it's Caesarus something Longinus was the name of that particular soldier. That particular soldier was the one who pierced him and got the blood sprinkled on his face when he pierced his heart. And now if you look at this verse and what it says, it's telling you what happened to that soldier. That soldier later went on to become an apostle, later went on to become a, an evangelist for Christ. And the story goes that he was beheaded at Pilate's request. He was martyred because he was once a soldier with one eye that was blind. But when the blood of Jesus, when he pierced him, healed him. And then he, he was astonished that, and he testified this surely is the son of God. The scripture says it, but it doesn't speak specifically to this point. And so when you read it now, it makes total sense. And it says the man who saw it, <laughs> his eye was healed. <laughs> his eyes it opened. And he said, the man who saw it says, I was healed. This testimony is true. I was there. Listen. And then it says, he knows that he tells the truth. <laughs> and he testifies so that you may also believe. He literally left the Roman centurion guard to become a follower of Jesus. He became a Christian. He was baptized by the apostles and began to testify to the goodness, the salvation, and the healing power of God. Can I tell you, he did this unto death as he was martyred for his faith. Now I, I leave you with this one question before we leave. There is a demonstration. It, I was blind, but now I see. He had an infection in one eye that was healed by the blood. Can I tell you, he wasn't preached the gospel. He wasn't told about Jesus. The healing power of his blood. He like literally healed him. That caused him to convert. Am I speaking to somebody? Sometimes this, this, this is, is the power Jesus. that we carry. It's the matter of the heart. This, this is, is the, the power that we carry unto salvation. Can I tell you, we are to become a living demonstration of the power of the blood of Jesus. That's why we come to church. That's why we study to show ourselves approved that's why we're here because we desire to be a living demonstration of the glory of God but I, I leave you with this question what would cause a man who was once in the world and had a centurion position which is not just a chump position that position is a Navy SEAL of the Roman Guard. 
what would cause this man to leave his position and his stature in Rome to go now proclamate and declare and evangelize the blood and the salvation and the good news of Jesus? What would cause a man to die for that message? I leave you with that question. because there's a tangible evidence of Jesus. When he struck Jesus in the heart with that spear and the water and the blood splashed upon his eyes, he didn't have to have a salvation message preached to him. He just had an encounter with the power of God to heal him instantaneously, removing the blinders. Can I tell you, he was blind in that I, now he can see not listen. This is not just that he can see physically. He saw spiritually. Not only did he see spiritually, after that they assigned that same soldier to guard the tomb where Jesus was buried. And he witnessed Jesus resurrect from the dead. And when they asked him to lie about what he saw, he refused to lie. Why? Because he had a supernatural experience with Yeshua. No one needed to lay hands on him. No one needed to preach to him to say, to say this salvation prayer. It was the supernatural power of God that removed the blindness of this world that was yes. upon him. Yes. Allowing him to see yes. the reality and the true nature of God the Father, supernaturally, that he fled. Listen, he fled. After they asked him to lie, he fled. Became a monk. It states that he became a monk of some sort before becoming a disciple of Jesus to preach Listen, the you gospel. Can't have you can't yeah. have an encounter with Jesus you and be the same. You cannot and, and, and return to who you used to be. Can't do it. You cannot. So for those of you proclaiming Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Yeshua, your healer, you can't go back. So if you're sitting on the fence. Get off the fence. Oh, my God. If you're sitting on the fence, ask yourself, have you had truly an encounter with God? a life-changing experience with God, you can never be the same. You can never go back to the things that had you bound. You can never go back to the things that had you blind. So for those of you operating in two realms, the supernatural and the natural, ask yourself, are you surely saved and operating in the supernatural? Is there no way you could do both? This man could not return to being who he used to be. Come on. That's it. That's it. This is deeper. I don't know. I don't know who I'm talking to. I don't know if you're getting it. But you can no longer do the things that you used to do. He could no longer become and be that same Roman soldier. Under the law of Caesar. Blinded by the things of the world and the lies of the enemy. He now had a supernatural touch by Father. Which gave him a supernatural power to flee from that which had him bound to now serve unto death.
So enough. Enough. Enough with the one foot in, one foot out. Enough. Either you're all in or not. 99% of the truth is still a lie. 99% of the truth is still a lie. The Bible says that we can have a form of godliness but deny the power. A form of godliness. It's all talk. But no power. No demonstration. Just talk. Psychological babble. Seduction of words. My God is a God of demonstration. And I want it all. I can't go back. And we're not here to offend you. And we're not here to rebuke you. We're here to awaken you. We need to awaken you. Beloved, this world has nothing for us. Nothing. We're all passing through. We're pilgrims here. Do not be seduced by the things of this world. Do not. It's ridiculous. It's vanity. It's vanity. But in order to function in this world, we can't look like cuckoo kachoos. You know, we're not going to put on the camel hair and eat locusts because your testimony will, 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 never, will never reach those that need to be reached. Come on, I'm talking to somebody. So we have to, we have to, we have to operate in this realm. We have to be somebody in this realm. We operate in the heavenlies and in the natural, but the natural should never overtake what we understand to be eternal. Am I, am I getting through? Are you guys tracking with me? So please, beloved, listen to me carefully. Do not be seduced by the TikToks and the YouTube and the Netflix. You want to watch movies and listen, I'm not, I'm not here to tell you not to do those things. I'm here to tell you to discern. What is, what is pulling your attention? What is causing you, what is causing your affections to be lured into? Show me your treasures and I show you what owns you. Show me what you value. And I'll show you what owns you. So beloved, awaken, rise, wake up. Let's come out of that sleepy Laodicean culture that we used to call church and let us now become the church we were lulled to sleep but it's time to wake up and let us rejoice and praise him and give him glory because he's made a way the path is clear the question is now do you want to walk That's all there is to it. Do you want to walk it? Because I'm not here to pull you. I'm not here to twist your arm. And I'm not going to chase you. But I'll walk with you if you want to walk with me. I'll walk with you. Praise God. Praise God. Father, in the name of Yeshua, we thank you, Lord, for this precious teaching. Lord, you are magnificent, mighty. You are our joy, and you are our peace. You are all things. You are our hope. <laughs> you are our hope. And you are the prize. I ask you today, Lord, as your son, that you would break off every yoke, every deception, every affectionate thing that these beautiful people
people that you call your children have that are hindering them from seeing and manifesting your presence in their lives. I pray that every devil under the sound of my voice bow right now in the name of Jesus to the Lord Christ and the authority he has given us. You are under our feet. You have no power. So depart. Depart from these children of God. Awaken. Awaken, O sleepy one. Come out of the slumber. Come out of the passivity and enter into the joy of the Lord. Enter into the grace, the mercy, the favor of God as your life has already been written. And all that is required is that we walk in that which was already established. Father, open our eyes. Set our feet as hinds feet onto the path that we may be sure and steadfast on your call. Open the ears of the deaf and open the eyes of the blind that they may see and discern and hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, the true church, this hour. Thank you, Father, for your presence today. Thank you, Lord, for your love of these beautiful people. I ask that they would continue in their thirst and their quest and their hunger for you, Father. I pray like Jesus prayed for Peter, that the enemy looks to sift you and is accusing you day and night. But I pray that your faith fail not that your trust in him fail not. And this I pray in the precious, matchless, wondrous, power-filled, wonder-filled name of Yeshua the Christ, the Anointed One of Israel, the Messiah, the Savior, the Deliverer, and the Healer. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We love you guys. God bless you. Amen. Bless you. And now all of you that need to go and need to, you know, cook and do things in your home, you're dismissed. Hallelujah. We recorded this uh, teaching for your viewing pleasure afterwards. Uh, when it's rendered, we will put it up on the chat. Uh, and, and we bless you in the name of Jesus. For those of you who want to stay on for Q&A, we'll stay on and dig a little bit deeper for any questions that you have for prayer. Uh, for any comments that you have. Praise God. Thank you, everybody. God bless you. Hey, this is Michael from Remnant Rising Ministries. Please subscribe, hit like, and the notification bell if you'd like to be kept abreast of additional information and ongoings with our ministry. Hey, don't forget to hit the like button. Have an awesome day.